Hey. Hey. Welcome back to What, what the, the Death, Death podcast. Whew. Boy, do we have a story to share. Big story of a lot of things that happen back to back in one night. I feel like when it rains with us, it pours. <laughs> yeah. And I never felt like not wanting to be a woman until that day. So yeah, let us dive in and explain our story, give you our perspective, how we felt and our thoughts on this situation. Yes. Okay. So we had a friend come and visit us and she was from Kansas City. She was coming to visit and spend time with us in California. And luckily we actually had a work meeting in the morning and she was able to watch us in action. And it had to do with what the death. So we were so excited. We were dressed up professionally and cute. We had a jacket, jeans, all of those things. We showed it to the meeting and it went really, I mean, yeah, really well. It was a really good meeting to the point where we felt like we deserved to celebrate. Yes. So we went ahead and headed over to a local bar. Yeah, for and- happy hour. Yeah, we got together for happy hour and we had our interpreter with us too. So it was the four of us. Yeah, we had a good time. It was a good hour. We were able to catch up with everything and talk about what happened in that meeting and how excited we were. And when we were ready to leave, (laughs) do you want to explain the rest? Yeah, because I was the one who was driving. So at the bar, there was a valet and they told me to park in what was called a tandem parking spot, which means that there is a two car parking spot. I was like, okay. He told me to pull in all the way head first. And we decided to get in the car to leave. We got in the car and I started backing out and I forgot that I was really deep in the spot. I started turning my wheel and I ran into a concrete pole. And my taillight shattered everywhere. And my ego shattered (laughs) everywhere too. Oh. And that was the biggest thing. I mean, everyone was safe, but my pride of being a good LA driver was a little bit damaged. And damaged the reputation that deaf people can drive. I know. <laughs> I really, I, we can drive. I well, promise. I promise. It just, it, it just, happened. And it was, I mean, no one was hurt, just my pride. So I went to get out of the car to look at my tail light to see who was legitly broken. And it was. And also my blind spot sensoring system was off. And I was like, oh, I just had to hold it all in and say everything was fine. And get this. We had to go to another bar to meet up with another friend later that night. So I drove home and I told Carly, like, you are driving for the rest of the night because I am done driving for today. <laughs> and then we got to the next bar with our other friends and we had a good time. And then there were two guys that were sitting kind of across from the table that we were at and they were just staring. Granted, it was not just like that kind of staring, like they were intrigued because we were signing. No, it was like that full on creepy vibe kind of stare. So we'd started off. We're like, all right, we're just going to ignore it. We ignored it, but it continued on for like Mm -hmm. a good hour and they just kept staring. So Sarah decided to get up and go get some more drinks with her friends. They started to follow her. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, this, are they buying the drinks or what's going on here? So then Sarah came back and I was like, hey, did you know that they followed you? Did they buy you drinks or something or what? And she's like, no. So I was like, oh, so they just followed you just to watch you order drinks? Like what's going on? It was just the strangest thing. So I got up and headed to the bathroom. Then, okay. So my personality, I don't go off on people. I do. Carly tends to do that. I typically do the work. Yeah. But not this time. this time. Again, you have to remember, my car's taillight was broken. And I just kind of suppressed everything. And so Carly went to the bathroom. And I just kept on feeling the staring and the eyes constantly to the point where I looked directly at them. And they didn't know I can talk at the time. So I looked at the guys and spoke. And I said, hey, are you enjoying our conversations? And both of them were taken aback and were like, uh, 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 yeah, we are. And then I said, again, sorry for my French, but I said, 
didn't your mother teach you some manners? It's not polite to fucking stare. <laughs> <laughs> and then they both looked at each other, dropped their heads down, and left a little bit later. So we were relieved. And I just was able to breathe again. Finally, we can just get back to our conversations. But no. No. Nope. It was strike two. So the car was strike one. This was strike two. Mm-hmm. And then number three. Yeah, the third. Go ahead, Carly. <laughs> so where we were seated, we were outside by the sidewalk where there was a lot of people walking by. And I happened to sit up against the back end, which was right by the sidewalk where everybody was walking. And there was one, I don't know, just drunk person who seemed to be maybe homeless. I don't know. That's just my assumption. But he tried to enter the bar and the security guard would not let him because he was clearly under the influence and not capable of functioning to enter the bar. Well, apparently he walked up to my direction And, you know, I can't hear. So Sarah overheard that he told me what? So he said, hey, I have a ton of money. Can I buy you? And and, wait, he didn't even say can. He was like, I will buy you and take you home with me. Come follow me. Come with me. And I just acted deaf. No, I didn't act deaf. I actually continue to be deaf. (laughs) (laughs) You are. You didn't act deaf. You just decided to ignore it. (laughs) And I just looked away and I'm like, ugh. I mean, what do you, what, what makes you think that you can buy me? Like, first of all, and it just, it was just the and weirdest thing. He just stayed right behind you. Yeah. To the point where the security guard finally removed him. But I mean, that wasn't the end of it, right? <laughs> no. So the security guard kicked him out and he walked off into the distance, like off to the side, rounded the corner. And at the corner of the building, he kind of literally stuck his head off to the, off the wall and like gestured, come here. And was like waving at me, trying so hard to get my attention. And it was so hard because when I would look at my friend while she was signing, I could see him past her and just, he continued direct, like getting my attention for 30 minutes. And I'm like trying to avoid eye contact. And it just, I felt so uncomfortable in that moment. I mean, it doesn't even help that it was also 11 o'clock at night at that time. Yeah. It was late. It was dark. I mean, there was light on the street. So we could see him, but we still had to walk back to our car after. Yeah. I mean, we literally felt so uncomfortable to the point where we had to come up with a game plan on how we were going to leave this bar safely. So we talked and we figured out, okay, we're going to leave as a group. We left as a group to my car because my car was parked in the opposite direction where he was. My friend was parked in the direction where he was. So we got in my car and and drove off. off and dropped off my friend. So we were relieved until it was time to go home. And back to my place. (laughs) <laughs> safe place. place and safe just place. forget about the night so carly you drove and then what happened you explain because you drove so we turned onto the street where sarah's house is and we parked and again my gut instinct quickly kicked in once i saw this male on a bike coming towards our direction and the whole thing was just so weird and all three of us felt like something was off And he just rode his bike, saw us, and this is 1130 at night, so it's dark, but it felt like he, it seemed like he knew us. And we started overanalyzing, like, why would he know us? How would he know us? Did he study us before? Does he know where we live? Like all these small things started coming through our heads. And he just pulled up to the side across the street. I parked and we all decided that we were going to stay in the car. Yeah. I mean, there was something that made us think don't get out of the car. No. I mean, we're already sensitive with everything yeah. that's going on. All everything's really heightened. Just we're like, stay in the car. Right. So we stayed in the car and I looked over to my friend who is sitting on the passenger side on the opposite of me. And we're, we're both looking at him trying to figure out what the hell this man is doing. And he, because he's hiding behind a tree, he physically got off his bike, left it on the ground and went behind a tree. And we're like, my friend was looking at him. I was like, is he going to the bathroom? Like, Okay. So we just figured, okay, we'll let him go to the bathroom and then leave. And we'll just stay in the car and wait just to be safe. And no, he decided to come out from behind the tree, get in front of this parked truck that was sitting there, somebody else's truck. And literally, I'm not even joking, was masturbating in front of us. And looked directly at us, like dead eye contact. And just was going to town. Yeah. I mean, I was just so shocked like you're just shocked and frozen 
like, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing this? I mean, I was just so shocked. And so we were just like, you know what? Go like, let's just drive and find another place to park for now. So we turned on the car and we drove around the corner and I parked in this like little area store parking lot down the street. Maybe I should have gone a little further, but you know, (laughs) so we parked, thought we were good for now. And we were talking about what we should do because this place is like our safe place. This is Sarah's home. We had to get out of the car and get into the house to end our day, but we can't because it's not safe for us. So we're talking and out of nowhere, he comes up riding his bike. Like literally comes up and parks behind my car. Behind you. Yeah. And I couldn't back out at all. And so I'm just like, oh my goodness. Like I, uh, we were freaking out where I was just yelling at Carly, like back yeah. out, go, let's go. Just get out of here. Like get out of there. I don't know if he had a gun on him. I didn't know anything. Right. I just was thinking, get out of there. Luckily he moved away from the car. And then once he immediately moved, Carly backed up and left. And while we left, I called 911 and explained what was going on and where we're going to be at. And we drove to a, like a shopping center location and we told the police that and that's where we're going to be. And then police said, okay, stay there. They'll be on the way. So we arrived, we parked and just settled down a little bit, turned the lights off, turned the car off and just tried to process, process everything. the whole thing. That just happened. Like, what do we do? And so while we were waiting for the cops, luckily... At the shopping center or the strip mall or whatever, there was a night shift police officer there who was patrolling the center. And I thought, perfect. Yeah, like perfect. Yes. Right. Finally, someone I can actually talk with. So I got out of the car and approached him and explained everything that happened prior. And the first thing he did was laugh. He said, oh, this is L.A., no police is going to arrive anytime soon. Just letting you know. I was like, oh shit. Okay, fine. Whatever. That sucks. Then he looked at me dead in the eye and just hand up and down and said, by the way, you look really good in that outfit. Yeah. (laughs) After everything that's happened and everything I just explained from A to Z, all of that. And that man had the audacity to say, I look really good in an outfit. Yeah. I, I mean, my emotions, my feelings were just, were gone. I looked at Carly and I looked at our friend. I was like, he just told me I look really good in an outfit. I'm done. I'm done. My faith in humanity and men was gone in an instant, in that moment. Yeah. And I just felt so powerless. Yeah. We live by being strong, independent women. And I am proud of that. But that day, all of those labels of being a strong, independent woman was taken away by everything that had happened. I have never felt so powerless. And I'm like, and not only that, I was wearing something professional. I wasn't wearing short shorts or a low cut top, but still, but it still doesn't matter. Does not matter what my outfit was, what choices I make in my outfits. We don't ask for it. Right. We never ask for it. So the fact that this man took away my feeling of safety and confidence in an instant, and it was supposed to be a man of authority. Mm-hmm. Right. And just in that instance, he looked me up and down and told me I looked great in that outfit. So we got in the car, I called my parents and I told them, mom and dad, I'm staying at your house because I don't know if the other man was still at my house. I don't want him to know where I live. I was just over it. I was over the night. I just couldn't function. And then at the end of the night, we sat down and we're talking about all these little things that we could have done better, like but, flashing my yeah. lights or honking yeah. the horn. And I'm like, again, no, at the end of the day, we should not have to think about those kinds of things because this should have never happened. No, but people typically say, oh, that's just how men are. Or I know you live in LA. That's just how it is. Like they normalize this situation when I'm like, no, it doesn't matter if I didn't think about honking or it doesn't matter if I didn't think about flashing my headlights or all these little things. Bottom line is we're contributing to the ism 
for us to say, oh, you know what? It's normal. Men typically do that. Or, you know, how can we prevent this? How can we stop this and not normalize this? You know? And I looked at myself and I will admit, I was disappointed in myself on how I reacted. Again, like you said, Carly, we are strong, independent women. But in that moment, there was three of us and one of him and he was on a bike and we were in a car. In a car, yeah. And I didn't even think about making any kind of noise. I didn't even think about anything. Nothing came to mind and nothing can prepare you for this. And many people minimize this and think it's no big deal that it just happened. But yeah, but what if? What if? And there are women who had it worse. Right. And we just minimize the situation. Like, (sighs) it's so hard. What is the right thing to do? How can we improve on the situation? What can society do to help? Yeah. And not make us feel, because I'll admit, because when I called 911, I felt like I shouldn't have because my emergency isn't that important to them. Or they'll think that it's just no big deal. There's just a guy jerking off. Oh, you're fine. I mean, that thought did come across my mind, Yeah, but it shouldn't have. Yeah. But what could we have done? I don't even know. You know, like, and it didn't just happen anywhere. It happened on the street where you live and we couldn't even get out of the car and go through our front door without him knowing where we lived. And again, like it was a sticky situation and just, it was, it frustrated me as a woman to see society normalize this. And I still feel tense about it when I arrive home at night. Um, I hold my breath when I turn the corner because will he be there? Will another thing happen? I mean, that fear is now instilled in me because of one man. I I mean, just being a woman, it's hard. Yeah. And like, I saw this one woman, she had posted an Instagram video and she talked about how a lot of people overlook ism behaviors. And it really got me thinking about the situation that had happened to us. And she spoke about how it's normal for us women to enter a public women's restroom and see a sign that says, you know, please keep this bathroom clean. Please make sure you discard all feminine products in the trash can, not in the toilet, but there's nothing in the men's restroom. So is that called overlooking oppression? Because why don't you have a sign for the men's restroom that says, make sure you aim correctly or don't make a mess? Why do women have to have that sign? So it really got me thinking about the situation. And now that it's happened to us and they tell people about it and they say, oh, I know men typically do that. Is that overlooking an ism behavior? Because they normalize it. They're making it okay for men to continue this type of behavior when it's not okay. Even if it's a minimal situation, a man masturbating, I don't care. I didn't ask Ask for it. it. And the fact that I had to move my vehicle to a different location to show you that I don't enjoy this. I don't want this. Why do you continue coming towards us and continuing this behavior? So is that considered overlooking an ism behavior? Because you're minimizing it, which contributes to society to normalize it for men to continue doing these things to women. It's the same thing with everyday life, walking down the street. Men will whistle, call or whistle or do something like that. It's now, it's been a part of my life growing up. Yeah. And I feel like it happens every day and it becomes my normal. And I'm like, okay, whatever, just ignore it. But I shouldn't have to do that. And whose responsibility is it to educate? Whose responsibility is it to change that? And how? It's a genuine question. I'm asking you all, the audience. I'm asking you, Carly. I'm asking this to myself. Like, how can we as a society make this world a better one? And I understand it's not going to change overnight, but how do we take the appropriate steps? Yeah. What can we do to prevent that from happening? What can we do to make sure that we feel safe from here on out? Yeah. What can our people do to support us? You know, it's something for you guys to think about and digest ourselves and Think about how we want to react when people share stories like this. And when you happen to ever be in a situation like that, what can we do better? You know, those little things. I mean, it's a lot of small things and a lot of work that needs to be done, but we got to take it a step at a time. You know, it just, yeah. I think it starts with sharing this kind of stories too. Absolutely. And trying to figure this all out. We said this many times previously, there's never going to be a right answer. It's not going to be black and white, not going to be crystal clear, but starting a discussion about it and seeing where it goes mm-hmm. is how we start. Yeah. And if you have any 
questions or you want to share your stories and experiences, please email us at questions at what the deaf.com. We would love to hear from you all. Maybe you guys have some advice or stories that you want to share. Yeah. Let's have a dialogue. And don't forget to follow us at what the deaf on Instagram for all of the current updates. We love to connect with you all and we hope you guys are safe and healthy right now. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye everyone. We would like to thank dpan.tv and their services at aslcaptions.com for making the transcripts and captions of this podcast accessible for everyone. If you're looking for captioning or transcript services, they do amazing work.